a deep dive into the Gospel of Luke, an overview of the Gospel Canon, Part 2. Learning objectives for this session include the following. To test the traditional tests of canonicity, then to compare non-canonical Gospels, to defend the four canonical Gospels, to trace traditional Gospel lineages, and to introduce the Gospel of Luke. Amongst the traditional criteria for New Testament canonicity, one often encounters apostolicity, or historical succession. Since Jesus remains our sole authority, and his apostles' writings remain our best access to the historical Jesus. Jesus promised, The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you apostles everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. However, some critique this criterion, noting that there are books in the New Testament canons of all denominations that were certainly not written by an apostle. For example, the Gospel of Luke and the Epistle to the Hebrews. But one can reply, associates to apostles wrote with apostolic oversight and approval. Paul wrote, Apollos and myself learn through us what not beyond what is written means. Secondly, there is the te- Secondly, there is the test of orthodoxy, what some call normative doctrine or teaching. They mean the Apostles' teaching is true doctrine, and many later doctrines diverge from the truth. John noted, concerning the word of life, this life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father, and was revealed to us Apostles. By way of critique, there was no doctrinal standard common to all apostles and to the New Testament writings. Even the Gospels have distinct features and apply the Old Testament differently. To which one can reply, the apostles themselves recognized unique teachings in each other's writings. Peter wrote, Our brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him. A third canonical test is that of antiquity. Did a particular writing arise in the period of the Incarnation? The Apostles' so-called rule of faith was a criterion by which the early churches judged truth. So Jude wrote, I find it necessary to write and appeal to you to contend for the faith that was once and for all handed on to the saints. But we can critique. There were already non-canonical Gospels or sayings of Jesus circulating before the appearance of the canonical Gospels, to which one may reply, canonicity allows for both the period of the Incarnation and the lifetimes of Jesus' apostles. By way of a small sample of 1st and 2nd century Gospels that are not admitted into the canon, there is the Egerton Papyrus, a collection of miracles and sayings attributed to Jesus, some of which are extra-canonical, that is, they do not appear in the four canonical Gospels. Early Church Fathers mentioned the Ebionite Gospel, which denied the virginal conception of Jesus. Widely read and recommended was a writing titled Shepherd of Hermas, a collection of visions and commands supposedly given by Jesus. And recently discovered the Coptic version written in the early centuries in Coptic translated from Greek, teaching Gnostic doctrines. Fourthly, there is the criterion of inspiration, 
were a book's writers moved by the Holy Spirit, the Apostles' rule of faith was a criterion for the early church's acceptance of a book. So Peter wrote, Understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will. However, we can critique. Early church leaders believed that their unique canon of books was divinely inspired, including disputed books that were later rejected. For example, the Book of Enoch. Can we reply? A book's inspiration is inferred from its authoritative apostolic source since we do not know directly what is or is not inspired. Then the test of usage. Was there widespread recognition of a book amongst the early churches? Books that all or most of the churches accepted as authoritative should be in the canon of Scripture. So Paul wrote, When this letter has been read amongst you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you read also the letter from Laodicea. By way of critique, some books did not arrive at all the churches, and not all those that arrived in a church survived or proved edifying. So we reply, over time, most churches came to approve the most useful books. These form the common canon to which some churches add other books. The lineages of the four canonical Gospels seem to be the following. The Apostle Matthew wrote or compiled the Gospel of Matthew. Peter and his son Mark produced the Gospel of Mark. The Apostle Paul and many eyewitnesses together allowed Luke to compose the Gospel of Luke. And the Apostle John, from his tedious memory, was able to compose the Gospel of John. Justin Martyr observed, The Apostles in the memoirs composed by them, which are called Gospels, have thus delivered unto us what was enjoined upon them. Now, some like to suppose that each gospel has a unique emphasis. Matthew presents the Messiah as the king. Mark, the Messiah as a servant. Luke, the Messiah as a human being. And John, the Messiah as a divine incarnation. Or, using Ezekiel's symbology, Matthew is the lion Mark the bull, Luke the man, and John the eagle. Our conclusion regarding the Gospel of Luke, then, most Christian churches have in their New Testament canon the same 27 books. Some churches, however, include other books in their Old Testament or New Testament canons. All Christian churches have the same four Gospels in their canon. Thus, all Christian churches recognize the authority and inspiration of the Gospel according to St. Luke. Let's note three of the earliest textual witnesses to Luke's Gospel. Papyrus P4, copied in the 2nd century, contains much of the first six chapters of the Gospel of Luke. Papyrus 75, from the 2nd or 3rd century, much of the rest of the Gospel of Luke. Greek Codex Aleph, called Sinaiticus, from the 4th century, was written in uncial letters on parchment. Besides canons of the Old and New Testament, it includes as well the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas. Now, Luke is a synoptic gospel. That is, it shares a lot of material in common with the gospels of Matthew and of Mark. Scholars discuss and debate continuously the priority of these books, which was written before the other. Mark, Matthew, Luke, and their dependence. 
How much does Luke depend upon Mark and upon Matthew for material? And other written sources from which Luke may have drawn? And what about oral sources? Did Luke interview eyewitnesses during his sojourn in the Holy Land? And translation? Was any of these Gospels first written in Aramaic and later translated into Greek? And redaction? How much has each Gospel been edited in the early centuries? So, regarding the origin of Luke's Gospel, first, the conservative view. Luke's Gospel was composed between the years 59 and 63 CE under the Apostle Paul's tutelage. The author, then, is Luke, Paul's missionary companion. This gospel was widely known and copied by many in the second century and after. However, there is also a liberal view, which suggests that the book was composed later, between the years 80 and 110 CE. Thus, the author is unknown and actually, they say, contradicts Paul and may still have been revised sometime in the second century. Some wonder if this passage from 2 Timothy 4 was not the occasion of the composing of Luke's Gospel, when Paul wrote to Timothy, saying, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Thus we suggest that Luke was either a literate Gentile or a Hellenized Jew, and maybe was a physician. By way of summary regarding the theology of Luke's Gospel, we have a fourfold salvation history. There was the period of the law the prophets, and the psalms, looking forwards to salvation. Then the kingdom of God came in the persons of John and Jesus. The Holy Spirit, who followed Jesus, still abides in believing communities, as we believers await Jesus' return as the Son of Man. There is also personal salvation. For all who repent of their disbelief and of their disobedience, these will be alive with Jesus when their body dies, and we live in hope of resurrection and of participating with Jesus when he reigns as king over all the earth forever. The structure of Luke's gospel consists of some nine distinct phases. First, the preface naming the sponsor, Luke's method and his purpose. Secondly, the birth narratives, which indicate the dawn of the promised new era. Thirdly, John's mission to introduce the Messiah, and Jesus' mission when he resisted temptation and hostility from religious and civil leaders. Then his long journey towards Jerusalem, performing messianic signs and his astonishing teaching. His ministry at Jerusalem then, when he had to confront Israelite and Roman rulers, leading to his crucifixion, following the Last Supper, arrest, and trials. Eighthly, his resurrection after three days, when he showed himself alive with many proofs. And finally, his ascension into the heavens when he gives the Holy Spirit and commissions his apostle to go to the nations. Thus, in this course, we shall seek to do the following. First, to believe Jesus' teaching, to claim Jesus' promises, to obey Jesus' commands, to defend Jesus' deity, to hope for Jesus' return, to experience Jesus' power through the Holy Spirit, and to proclaim Jesus' good news to all who will listen.